The Boys, Volume 2, Get Some, written by Garth Ennis, art by Derek Robertson. If you haven't watched my video on Volume 1, go do that now. Link in the description and then come back here for Volume 2. So in uh, Volume 2, we're going to be going through issues 7 through 14. And there's two story arcs in here. The first one is called Get Some. And the second one is called Glorious Five-Year Plan. So uh, last volume, we met, you know, sort of all the characters. We met the various boys. We met the seven. We met various, uh, you know, other people. And in this volume, we're going to be meeting more characters. We're going to be meeting more superhero teams. We're going to learn sort of how the world works, how everyone's sort of interconnected. So it's going to be a good time. Also, in the first volume, you might have noticed some Garth Ennis's sort of uh, sexual perversion elements in his story. And he really ramps that up in this volume. There is some sort of messed up stuff in here. Really twisted, but you know, kind of fun. Uh, also, it's really fun seeing his various twists on DC and Marvel heroes in here and sort of the weird places he goes with them. So uh, let's dive into the story. Issue 7, Get Some, Part 1 of 4. So the book opens up and we are introduced to this guy in a robot outfit named Tech Knight, AKA Robert Vernon. So what you need to know about Tech Knight is he's sort of like Bruce Wayne. You know, he has a mansion, he's a billionaire, but he's merged with sort of Iron Man. So, you know, he has a robot suit and that's sort of what lets him be a superhero. So Tech Knight, that's who Tech Knight is. And he is one of the founding members of this group called Payback. So this volume opens up with him talking to a therapist. And he says to the doctor, Doctor, I can't stop fucking things. <laughs> and we learn that he is suffering from this odd compulsion to fornicate with any orifice that presents itself. He tells a story of being a part of this hero group and they are flying in the sky and then all of a sudden this tech knight, he sees this other hero, Mini Droid's ass and he just couldn't help himself. So mid-flight, he has to have sex with it and he rapes it to death, this droid. <laughs> so after this, he got suspended from the group because of it. And you know, the therapist is questioning whether tech knight is gay. And uh, Tech Knight denies this. He says he just feels these urges. He can't explain it. And we also learn that Tech Knight has a superhero sidekick named Ladio. So once again, think of Batman. Uh, Ladio is R Robin. So Ladio is Robin. And I love the name Ladio. It's so stupid. Like a lad, Ladio. Anyway, so that's his Robin. And a Tech Knight has managed to avoid any sort of uh, sexual stuff with this Ladio. But uh, one night, uh, Tech Knight was having sex with the tailpipe of the Techmobile. And uh, Ladio overheard this. And, you know, that's sort of something that's sort of bothering Tech Knight. So as the session is wrapping up, uh, Tech Knight fucks the cat in the therapist's office while the therapist like ref le left the room for a few moments uh and all of a sudden when he came back the cat had sex and the therapist is pissed at this and he tells tech knight to leave and never come back <laughs> back at the tech knight cave uh tech knight is hanging out with ladio his sidekick and ladio is doing some lunge exercises <laughs> And uh, Tech Knight worries he won't be able to control his sexual urges, so he sends Ladio on something he calls a hero quest. And he tells Ladio to go visit various superhero groups and learn everything he can from them. And you know, Ladio leaves and goes to do this, and then Tech Knight says to himself, Boy, that was close. <laughs> so that's sort of Tech Knight, guys. Then we jump over to the boys. And we see Butcher, and he is introducing Huey to this guy named uh, Giuseppe Maguini, who owns this comic shop. So Butcher and Huey, they are browsing this comic shop, and Butcher explains that comics are sort of propaganda for the various superheroes. So these comics are made of 
sort of like stories of their real life superheroes that are, are in their world. So, you know, you'll have a Tech Knight comic, you'll have a comic about the Seven, etc. And the comics are often sort of like propaganda and sort of ways to sort of spin the superhero story in a, in a positive way and sort of like, you know, um, promote them to the wider world. However, Butcher explains that, you know, a lot of these heroes are actually sort of assholes in real life, as we sort of learned last volume. And Butcher explains that there was this one hero who had AIDS and infected three girls. So Butcher caught his dick off. And now the, quote, the savior of Hell's Kitchen has been sitting down to piss. <laughs> Implying that the hero that was uh, has AIDS and was raping girls was some, you know, an analog to Daredevil in, in this world. <laughs> So eventually Butcher and Huey, they go to the basement of this comic shop where they are meeting a comic book magnate and one of the Butcher's sources known only as The Legend. You know, The Legend is sort of like a big name in the comic book industry and you know, he knows all these players and uh, you know, he has this relationship with The Butcher. So The Legend uh, he wants the boys to investigate the mysterious murder of a young gay man uh, and he also says it was his sister's grandson uh, this gay man that died and he believes the murder of this gay man was committed by a superhero about six months ago and the police have given up on the case and the legend thinks it was this hero named Swing Wing who is a known homosexual superhero and uh, you know to go investigate that now, Swing Wing is, uh, think of Batman once again, you have Nightwing, so Swing Wing is Nightwing. He used to be Ladio, but then he sort of graduated and became Swing Wing, and Swing Wing is supposedly gay, so you know, you know, those are sort of the new heroes that we have that we're gonna, sort of going to be following this story arc. Now, jumping over to issue 8, get some part 2. We start off with Tech Knight once again, and he's at his mansion, and he's talking to his butler, Thomas, who apparently Tech Knight fucked in the ear, <laughs> which was a line too far for the butler. So the butler's like, you know, I deal with lots of stuff, but that, that was that's too much. So he's out of there. And then we learn that this uh, dead gay teen that the boys are supposed to investigate was named Steven Rubenstein, and he was aged 18. And uh, Huey and Butcher go to investigate into this murder by talking to people Steven knew. So they go to this gay bar called the Red Rooster, and they ask this guy, Paul Drake, and his boyfriend, Max, questions about this Steven, this gay murder victim. So the guys at the bar say Steven was a big fan of Swing Wing. And uh, this Swing Wing, he, you know, he was a gay superhero. He used to go to these community meetings of all these various homosexuals where Swing Wing would do these like meet and greets with the gay community. He was like their hero, you know, he was uh, one of the only gay superheroes. So he was like a celebrity in that community. And uh, this Steven really idolized this Swing Wing and he would often try to talk to him at these meetings. But Swing Wing was often uh, very busy and you know, he never really sort of uh, managed to uh, deal with Steven that much. Later on, back at uh, their base, Huey is talking to Mother's Milk, and he asks if Mother's Milk ever killed someone. And uh, this is Huey is sort of feeling bad for accidentally killing that guy Blarney Cock last volume. And uh, you know he he wants to ask Mother's Milk like how he deals with death, right? And Mother's Milk says that you know he's never killed anyone that didn't deserve it, so you know he doesn't really feel bad about the people he's murdered. Uh, then Mother's Milk and Huey start talking about Butcher, and Huey says that uh, you know he was surprised that Butcher was very friendly and comfortable in that gay bar, you know. He thought that, you know, Butcher's this really sort of tough guy and he often throws around the sort of like rough sort of homophobic language and he calls various, you know, gays poofs and uses a little bit of a derogatory language. 
but uh, you know, um, Huey kind of thought that maybe Butcher hated gays, but Mother's Milk explains that, you know, it's just language. Butcher doesn't hate anyone that doesn't deserve it. And the Butcher was like really cool in that gay bar. You know, he, he was not bothering him at all. So this is sort of like an interesting exploration of Butcher's character. Even though he just has this rough exterior, you know, he really cares about a lot of people that, uh, that are good people. So Huey and Butcher then decide that they should go see this Tech Knight. And uh, Butcher explains they never really bothered with Tech Knight in the past because he was always so boring and he stayed under the radar. Now this issue ends with the doorbell ringing and Tech Knight, you know, he's in his mansion and he changes out of his outfit into his civilian clothes. And then he goes to the front door, the door opens, and Butcher and Huey are there and they are confronting Tech Knight. So when we jump over to issue 9, get some part 3. Butcher and Huey go into Tech Knight's mansion and, uh, you know, they question. First, they say, are you Tech Knight? And, you know, he, Tech Knight, of course, denies it. You know, if you ask Bruce Wayne if he's Batman, he's going to deny it. But they quickly go into the mansion and they find a, a, you know, a bookcase that they can open. And then it, it's a hidden doorway and it leads down to the Tech Knight cave. And, uh, you know, they they clearly know that he's Tech Knight. Butcher explains that six years ago, one of Tech Knight's friends in that payback superhero group got really coked up, beat up, beat up his girlfriend and put her into a coma. And uh, Butcher found out about this, but he kept it quiet in exchange for info on every one of his teammates down to the smallest of detail. And uh, that is why Butcher knows who Tech Knight is and knows almost every detail about Tech Knight's life. So Butcher is questioning Tech Knight, and then Huey, meanwhile, has to go to the bathroom in this Tech Knight cave. So he asks where the bathroom is, he gets pointed to it, and Huey heads over there. Meanwhile, Butcher and Tech Knight talk. Butcher is sort of, you know, uh, interrogating him. Butcher wants to talk to this Swing Wing, but he doesn't know where Swing Wing is. And, uh, you know, Tech Knight says, you know, fine, he'll pass along this information, but he doesn't really give anything at the moment. And he starts getting uh, dismissive with Butcher. And, you know, Butcher eventually goes to leave. But, you know, Tech Knight's like, yeah, I'll give you the information, whatever. So Butcher's heading out. But uh, meanwhile, Huey, on his way to the bathroom, you know, he's walking over it. By the way, in the background, we sort of see a watermelon that has had been, you know, Tech Knight had sex with because you see the hole in the watermelon. <laughs> Anyways, Huey gets to the bathroom door, but there's some sort of security lock on it, and Huey can't hold it in any longer. He can't figure out the lock, so he accidentally shits on the floor. <laughs> so Huey and Butcher leave back at the boys' headquarters. They're all laughing about Huey having shit on the floor of Tech Knight's tech cave. And uh, Butcher says, you know, it was too funny to not tell everyone. So, you know, they're all laughing at Huey over this. Later on in the day, Huey heads back over to the Red Rooster. And he's talking to this one guy, Max, who they questioned earlier. And Max says he has more to the story than he initially told. Uh, Max says that one day he figured out Swing Wing's secret identity because he saw Swing Wing leaving this community meeting that he would always go to. And Swing Wing left early and changed into his civilian identity and walked to a nearby motel. And uh, this Max, he saw the whole thing. Now he knows what Swing Wing looks like. He knows where he's staying, etc. So a few nights later at the gay bar, Steven, the murder victim, who was obsessed with this Swing Wing, is making a scene and he's hitting on Max's boyfriend. So Max decides, you know, in order to get Steven away from his boyfriend, he's going to tell Steven where he can meet Swing Wing in person. And, you know, he figures he can bring Steven and his idol together. Steven will leave his boyfriend alone and, you know, will be out of his hair. So perhaps, you know, they it's really showing that this swing wing is really potentially the guy that killed the, this Steven guy. So the boys really have to meet swing wing back at headquarters. Huey returns only to see butcher and everyone with holding a copy of the New York post with the headline on the front page, homo hero millionaire socialite revealed to be tech Knight, tried to rape family Butler pervert. 
So, apparently, the butler, when he left Tech Knight's mansion and quit his job, he immediately went to the press and he sold his story to the highest bidder. So the boys figure they should go revisit Tech Knight now, who's probably on edge now after this whole story coming out. Now, on the way to Tech Knight's place, Butcher explains, unlike most superpowered people, Tech Knight never took this compound V. So he has no real power. If you get him out of his robot suit, he's kind of useless. So they show up, they go to confront Tech Knight. Tech Knight, you know, he doesn't want to talk to them. He's going to attack them. He's going to attack, you know, Butcher and Huey. But all of a sudden, the female is there to take Tech Knight down and destroy his suit. So now Tech Knight gets to talking. Tech Knight explained that Swing Wing isn't even gay. And Tech Knight also explains about his own sort of problem where Tech Knight feels, you know, compelled to have sex with everything. People, inanimate objects, he has no control over it. And Swing Wing told the Seven about it. I mean, remember the Seven, they are like the Avengers or the Justice League. They are the big heroes in this world. And uh, the Seven were thinking about letting Tech Knight join them, which would be huge for Tech Knight. But Swing Wing wanted to ruin Tech Knight's chances. So uh, Swing Wing told the Seven all about Tech Knight's sexual compulsion. But why would Swing Wing sort of double cross Tech Knight and want to screw him over? Well, Tech Knight explains it all happened because of a person named Talon. Something that happened way back to the early days of uh, Tech Knight and Latio's Rogue Gallery. So he explains that back in the day, when Swing Wing used to be Latio, there was this female villain named the Talon. She's kind of like Catwoman, so think of Catwoman when you think of this Talon person. Sometimes she's good, sometimes she's bad. You know, it sort of goes back and forth, but you know, they have lots of history. So uh, after they've been sort of, you know, fighting back and forth for years, one night she comes back out of the blue and no one can remember if she's good or bad, but as the night goes on, they wind up back at Tech Knight's place for like some drinks and stuff and some wine. And she says, why don't you invite Swing Wing and we'll make it a proper reunion. So they're all reminiscing, you know, they're drinking, they're talking about the old days, Swing Wing's there, they're having a good time, talking about various groups and teams and what these other heroes are up to and, and you know, the night's progressing. And then all of a sudden, uh, she starts kissing Swing Wing. So, you know, Tech Knight is like, all right, time for me to leave then. You know, they're making out. I don't want to be here for that. But all of a sudden, this Talon, she grabs Tech Knight's thigh. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the sexual energy between the three of them starts ramping up. And they're going to have a threesome. <laughs> so... Tech Knight is having a threesome with Talon and Swing Wing, and uh, Tech Knight's trying to avoid eye contact with Swing Wing. As you can imagine, if Batman and Robin were having a threesome with Catwoman, you know, Bruce Wayne would want to avoid contact with Dick Grayson. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so he's trying to avoid eye contact with Swing Wing's. But then all of a sudden, we see Swing Wing's stupid looking face, and Swing Wing says, Suck it, baby. Suck his big bamboo. <laughs> and everything went downhill from there, as you could imagine. Going over to issue 10 now, get some part four, the final issue in this story arc. Uh, Butcher and Huey leave Tech Knight. You know, Tech Knight has explained why him and Swing Wing's relationship fell apart after this threesome and, you know, it made stuff all weird and downhill from, from, from then. And then also Tech Knight sort of explained his sort of sexual compulsion thing and how he was not in fact the murderer. So the boys decide to go off and finally confront this Swing Wing. They go wait for him at his apartment. And when Swing Wing shows up, you know, he's being dismissive. He's asking, you know, who the fuck these people are. He wants to see their ID. He is ignoring their questions. Uh, now, we Huey starts showing some backbone. You know, he is pissed at this Swing Wing acting like a jerk. And he says, Swing Wing better talk or I'm going to beat the shit out of you. 
and uh, Swing Wing decides to clock Huey in the face and then runs off. So they chase him onto the rooftop, Huey tackles him, and with his new compound V powers, manages to punch Swing Wing in the face. You know, Swing Wing doesn't actually have uh, superpowers, so Swing Wing is actually pretty injured by this. So once again, you gotta think back to uh, Nightwing in the DC Universe. Uh, Nightwing doesn't actually have any superpowers, he's just, you know, good at fighting. So that's the same thing with Swing Wing. So Swing Wing's been beaten, and now he's gonna tell his story. Well, Swing Wing explains that this Steven figured out his identity and showed up at his apartment or motel and confronted him. And Swing Wing was talking to this Steven. He's trying to be nice with him. Uh, Steven professes his love for Swing Wing. And Swing Wing sort of freaks out and he accidentally pushes uh, Steven off of the roof and kills him. So it was kind of just an accident. We also learned that Swing Wing isn't even really gay. He was just chosen by that group of Vought American who owns a lot of the various superhero groups in America and sort of funding them and making money off them. He was chosen by this Vought American and this uh, comic book people and their propaganda arm that he was going to be the gay friendly superhero, but he actually secretly hates gay people and he refers to them as like filthy faggot disease ridden faggot scum like he is just like a mean guy and you know he really does not like these people so after hearing swing wings confession butcher decides you know rather than arrest swing wing or kill him they are going to let swing wing be and let him continue onwards but swing wing is going to be a source of information for the butcher whenever the butcher needs any info you know swing wing is going to have to provide it and provide any favors so swing wing is kind of pleased by this and you know that's sort of uh the conclusion of sort of uh that whole thing afterwards huey and butcher are out eating at a diner and they are discussing the results of this mission and this investigation huey becomes a little depressed that there's no real justice for the murder victim but overall they seem relatively pleased huey knows butcher will most likely make swing wings life a living hell when you know they ask for various favors and information from him and butcher also thanks huey for doing a good job and catching stuff that he might have missed you know if uh huey wasn't on their team now, the epilogue, we're going back over to Tech Knight and sort of finding out what, what happened with him. Tech Knight, disgraced by his former butler's expose of his sexual perversion condition, uh, you know, Tech Knight, he rescues a woman from a falling wheelbarrow. So, you know, some wheelbarrow was fell off a rooftop or something, was going to fall on this woman and crush her, but Tech Knight managed to save her. But then after rescuing her, this woman, uh, he hears of an asteroid the size of Texas flying towards Earth. So we sort of have an Armageddon situation with this asteroid. Uh, Mission Control says there's a small orifice less than an inch in diameter with what appears to be organic matter inside. Tech Knight says, gentlemen, if it's got a hole, I can fuck it. <laughs> he flies up to space and starts having sex with the asteroid, talking dirty to it. You know, he's going to destroy it by having sex with it. People on Earth are cheering him on, saying he is a true hero. Lay some pipe. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, he comes and destroys the asteroid and it explodes. And Mission Control says, you did it, Tech Knight. You saved the world. And then in the last scene between Huey and Butcher, we learn that it turns out when Tech Knight saved the woman from the falling wheelbarrow, it actually fell and killed him. And this whole asteroid thing was revealed to be a hallucination. Tech Knight dreamed up before dying from his injuries. We also learn from the autopsy that his delusions and sexual compulsion turned out to be the result of a large brain tumor that was you know on his brain and it was the explanation for his erratic behavior so this brain tumor sort of caused his brain to sort of be all sexually perverted so you know that is sort of the end of tech night and that is sort of the end of this story arc and then butcher says 
that now them and the boys, they got to go head off to Moscow for the next job. So going over to issue 11 now, the new story arc is called Glorious Five-Year Plan, part one of four. So the boys arrive in Russia. They've hitched a ride with the CIA freighter plane, and it's transporting tons of prisoners with hoodies on. Probably Garth Ennis doing a little bit of commentary on like Guantanamo Bay and you know the uh, prisons there. So uh, they're in Russia, and it is freaking cold. They are freezing. Uh, when they arrive there, their ride that's going to drive them around the town is that CIA analyst Kessler, aka Monkey, and we met him all the way back in issue one. So apparently he was stationed in the Russian embassy previously, so he is kind of the boys' tour guide here. So the boys get a ride into town, Butcher arrives at this bar and says hello to his Russian friend, Vasily Varishkin, aka Vass. AKA the ex superhero known as Love Sausage. <laughs> so, this Vass is an ex cop and an ex superhero, and he is a part of the uh, Russian hero team called Glorious Five Year Plan. And Butcher explains that the reason they are here is because over the last two weeks, various superpowered people's heads have exploded in Russia. So they are here to sort of investigate this. Uh, Butcher guesses that maybe it has to do with this early 90s boosted version of Compound V that was a little unstable and if you injected it into a superpowered person, it'd become like a time bomb and it would eventually go off. So this is what Butcher is theorizing is going on. Uh, Vass brings them some strong vodka for them all to drink. Now Butcher and the rest of the boys, they just pretend to drink it when they're all doing their celebratory shots. They sort of throw it behind their shoulder, but uh, Huey didn't see them do this. So Huey actually drank this drink and it's so strong, he is like actually going into a little bit of a choking fit because you know, this Vass, he just loves drinking this strong Russian drink. <laughs> so the boys, they head to the mortuary to see the dead body of one of these uh, guys whose head exploded and the reason they're there in Russia. And the body belongs to a member of Russian organized crime. So whatever this mystery is going on, it's involving Russian organized crime. Uh, back at the bar, the boys receive a pizza delivery and it has someone's face on it with an eye patch on this pie. So it's perhaps a warning to the boys. Also in this opening issue, we are introduced to this uh, villain character named Nina Namenko, aka Little Nina, and she is a Russian mob boss who is uh, very, very tiny. And in this issue, she's flying this private plane, so she's obviously very rich and sort of powerful. And uh, once again, with the sexual perversion stuff Garth Ennis loves, she is uh, using this vibrator in the plane while flying, and the pilots are sort of, uh, you know, kind of uh, surprised by this um, behavior going on. Finally, when she arrives in Russia, she is having a meeting with this man from Washington. And we're going to find out who this man is in subsequent issues. So jumping over to issue 12 now, Glorious Five-Year Plan Part 2. So Nina is having a meeting with that man from Washington. And we learn that this man from Washington represents the group Vought American. So once again, to further explain what this Vought American is, as it's an organization we're going to see a lot in the boys uh, in the future issues. They are a large defense contractor which owns the seven as well as several smaller superhero teams and their related franchises. So they are the money people behind the seven, behind various heroes, and they are there to sort of make money off of these heroes and sort of sell their services. So the specific guy the little Nina is meeting, this guy is named James Stillwell is one of the guys who sits in the meetings with the Seven. Going back to a panel in issue four, we see him sort of in the background watching the meetings of the Seven going on. So we learn throughout this issue that this Vought American group, they are working with little Nina to engineer a coup in Russia and with an army of like 150 East European Russian superpowered people, all sort of organized by little Nina, 
who will sort of ravage the country with these superpowered people before she is eventually going to remotely detonate them all because of this unstable compound V thing I mentioned earlier. You know, it would be able to cause people's heads to explode. So the idea is they're sort of going to ravage Russia and then little Nina is going to sort of uh, come to the rescue and stop all these superpowered people and then they will perhaps put her in charge of the country. So there's also these two Vought American guys, these surveillance people, watching this whole meeting going down. These people are going to be important later. So remember, we also have these Vought American surveillance guys in the mix. Meanwhile, the boys have received that pizza with the face on it, and they discover that there are two hitmen waiting for them in a parked car outside of Vass's bar. So the Frenchman manages to sneak up on these hitmen and kill them really brutally. And the boys rough up the remaining hitman and manage to beat some information out of him. This hitman, he squeals about little Nina and tells the boys about her meeting at the hotel with the man from Washington. And uh, you know, the hitman seems utterly terrified of little Nina. We also learn that Vass's vodka that they were drinking earlier that Huey drank and made him sort of feel really sick is actually brake fluid. He likes a strong drink and he loves drinking brake fluid. He developed a taste for it when he was in Afghanistan. And uh, even though Huey is not really that pleased with this information, he's willing to share another glass of this brake fluid with uh, Vass and they sort of cheers and uh, chug it down. So then the boys head over to the hotel and try to catch little Nina in her um, meeting. And as they show up, they see little Nina sort of uh, taking off. So Mother's Milk, he heads into the hotel and he's going to talk to the bartender, see if he can get more information on the man from Washington. Butcher and Huey, they follow little Nina in a taxi and uh, sort of track her back to her base. And uh, then Huey and Butcher, they're able to see all of those 150 superpowered people that little Nina has under her control and has been sort of cultivating for months. And they're all taking little, um, and they're all taking orders from little Nina, plotting. Uh, Butcher suspects that they are planning some sort of coup, so Butcher is starting to sort of put the pieces together here. Jumping over to issue 13, Glorious Five-Year Plan Part 3, the boys were spying on that hotel and they eventually managed to snap a picture of the man from Washington. Butcher eventually recognizes this guy as the one who sits in those meetings with the seven, because you know Butcher has sort of been surveilling them, so he recognizes this guy. He knows the man from Washington here is important and pretty high up. So Butcher is sort of starting to put more and more of these pieces together here, right? The boys head to the airport for some more surveillance. Eventually, Butcher finds those two Vought Americans surveillance members I mentioned earlier and they are sort of sitting in their private plane. Butcher sort of goes into the plane and he manages to get some more information out of them and uh, he eventually figures out their entire master plan and Butcher is going to give them to the CIA so they can sort of build some sort of case against the Seven and Vought American and also Butcher manages to sort of get the detonator that's going to work with all of these super powered people with the unstable compound V in their blood. Later on, the boys are back at Vass's bar and are talking. Turns out that that man from Washington, uh, he's the one that sort of hired little Nina to take out the boys, and that's why all these hitmen are going after them. And, you know, the boys are putting together the whole picture. So, Vought American is working with this little Nina. Little Nina is gathering these 150 superpowered people. Only she would have the connections to do this with her criminal underworld sort of dealings. And little Nina is going to set them loose. They're going to cause havoc on Russia. And when Russia is panicked and stuff is going crazy, little Nina will blow them all up with the special device tuned to all of the superpower people's frequency. And, you know, she's been housing these, these superpower people and feeding these people for months. She's been slipping it into their food. And uh, once little Nina kills all these superpower people with uh, the detonation device, she will become like the savior of Moscow. And by becoming this savior of Moscow, little Nina is hoping that the people will choose her to be the next leader of the country. At least that is sort of the plan. And that's the plan that little Nina thinks is happening. 
However, what little Nina doesn't know is that Vought American is a double crossing her. The device that she has tuned to the various superpowered people and thinks is going to make them all explode isn't actually tuned to anything. Vought American was just using little Nina as a pawn, and they have another figure they want to put in charge of Russia. And the reason Butcher knows this is because he has the real detonator. He has the actual one that works, and he knows the one that little Nina has is a fake. So, the boys and Vass, they start eating some of Vass's borscht. And they're sort of regrouping here, but it turns out that this borscht was poisoned by little Nina's hitman, and all the boys start getting affected by it and passing out, except for Huey and Vass for some reason. So why haven't they been affected? Just then, some gunmen bust through the door, but Vass goes apeshit, and he sort of takes them all down, and afterwards he explains to Huey that the poison borscht must not have affected Vass and Huey because they are the only ones that have been drinking that break fluid drink. And that brake fluid drink must be so strong it can kill any poison in their system. Where the other members of the boys did not drink this drink so they were in fact poisoned and they've uh, been forced to sort of been passed out here and been knocked unconscious. So Vass then heads into the next room in the bar and then he returns in his superhero costume Love Sausage, and together him and Huey have to go and take down little Nina before it is too late. Jumping over to issue 14, Glorious Five Year Plan Part 4, the last issue in this storyline, Love Sausage and Huey break into little Nina's hideout and take out some lieutenants of hers. Love Sausage is an absolute beast. Uh, when one of the uh, henchmen of Little Nina sort of runs away through the strip club downstairs, the boys sort of eventually catch up to him and beat some information out of him. Uh, Little Nina, though, at this point has been warned. She knows the boys are onto her and that her hitmen have failed. She decides she's going to run and escape the country. She's on her plane. It's taken off. The boys are too late to the airport to stop her. Uh, little Nina, she thinks she's gotten away. She's on her private plane going back to wherever she's from. But all of a sudden she pulls out her vibrator that she had in the beginning of this story arc. And what she doesn't know is that Butcher thought ahead and he put a bomb in her vibrator. And as she turned it on, it activated and exploded. And little Nina is now dead. Back at Vass's bar, the rest of the boys are recovering from their poisoning. They're conscious again. You know, Butcher's awake. Everyone's awake. And we learn that this Vought American, what their end goal was, was to put a communist leader back in charge, not little Nina. They had another person in mind that they wanted to put in charge. And they were going to give that other guy the detonator and make him blow up all these superpowered people and save the country and become a hero. And, you know, uh, they were going to be able to put this communist guy back in charge, hoping that this would sort of restart the Cold War. And when the American people realize that the CIA can't protect them, then guess which company will be happy to take on the job? Vought American and their various superhero teams. So if the Cold War got restarted, Vought American would be in big business. But the, that crisis has been averted for the moment, and it's been foiled by the boys, and you know the Cold War is not going to be restarting. So before heading back uh, to America, Butcher is talking to one of his CIA people, and he's talking about sort of the uh, aftermath of this mission and all the information they've collected. And Butcher's like, you know, we got all this great information on Vought American and the Seven and that they were planning this whole coup. You know, we need to go after them. But Butcher learns that the CIA director, Susan Rayner, uh, she isn't going to do anything about it at the moment because she fears that Vought American would use their superhumans on the CIA and possibly America itself in retaliation if they were ever really threatened. And she doesn't think the CIA is ready to take that on at the moment. So the struggle continues for the boys. Butcher is kind of pissed, but you know, he has to continue onwards. Before leaving Russia, 
butcher alone heads down to where little Nina was keeping all those super powered beings and he detonates the devices in all of them and kills all 150 of them, sort of taking them off the board. The boys then head up to their plane. Love Sausage gives Huey a few bottles of his vodka, aka brake fluid, that's ended up actually sort of saving their lives. And with that, the boys are headed back home to America. Now this issue ends where we jump over to that man from Vought American, the man from Washington, who was uh, introduced more so in this book. And he's also on a plane heading back to America, and he's talking to the Homelander on the phone. Homelander, one of the members of the Seven. And he's telling the Homelander about the bad news in Russia, how the boys are still alive, and how the coup in Russia failed and the Cold War is not going to be restarted. And he tells the Homelander, you know, it never pays to underestimate the CIA. They sort of foiled them in this moment. Uh, you know, they invented international sabotage after all. He also tells the Homelander that, you know, uh, maybe the Homelander could grow a pair and deal with the boys and steal some of this stuff himself. And that is how this story arc ends. So that was The Boys Volume 2. What did I think of this storyline? Well, I thought the stuff with Tech Knight was hilarious, his compulsion of sex with everything. I liked the analogs to Batman, Nightwing, and Robin, and Catwoman, and seeing how that all interrelates. However, you know, Garth Ennis is clearly a pervert. He, he's got some weird sexual perverted stuff in this. In fact, when I was recording the storyline for those issues, my girlfriend overheard some of the plot points. And then when I was done recording, she said, that was disgusting what you were talking about. <laughs> and I was like, what? Tech Knight had sex with an asteroid and saved the Earth. That's just what happened. <laughs> So yeah, it's definitely really out there. I wonder if the Amazon Prime show is going to uh, go into all of that uh, stuff in depth with Tech Knight. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I thought that was a fun storyline. It was funny. I like the Russian storyline as well, where we're introduced to more characters and we're sort of seeing how the world of the boys sort of interrelates and everything is connected. So that was a good time as well. Yeah, I thought this was a good volume. I'm going to give it an 80 and a half out of 10 as well. Pretty equal to volume one. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good.